Hey, this is Robot here, ScooterWest.com. I'm going to go over how to overhaul a P200 fork. Uh, a couple different variations of the, the fork used on the P-Series Vespas. Uh, the one we're going to re reassemble is the earliest version, which has a 16 millimeter axle and a drum brake. The very last version that they've had on the PX actually had a disc brake and it had the larger 20 millimeter axle. Only difference between the later ones is they use some different part numbers for the seals and bearings. And overall, they all go, to, go together pretty much the same way. Even the one with the disc brake, the only thing you'd take off is a caliper off the actual carrier backplate part that Steve's uh, cleaning out right here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to go over what we did to the forks. Um, pretty much tore, tore the whole fork apart in the reverse order of how we're going to assemble it. So you'll have a good idea on how to tear down the fork after you see us put it together here. Um, the hub here. Some restorations, we, we prep these in, and paint them with single stage paint. Uh, this restoration, we actually powder coated these parts. Um, the thing with powder coating is you need to um, specify what you want to have masked and you have to remove all the rubber parts because they actually bake, these, bake the uh, finish on these. Uh, we went ahead and left the, uh, the brake inspection screw that's found on the American Market hubs. You can just leave that in there, never use it. Uh, bearings are all tapped out. Everything in here has been masked all the way through because there's bearing that goes through this side. The actual steel, steel cast in liner has been masked and all the threaded bosses have been masked over here. Uh, one little mistake on this is I would have just masked the threads and left the tips out to get exposed for the actual powder coating. That wasn't done on this hub. You can see they're kind of rusty. I'll go ahead and touch those up with like silver paint make this thing look perfect when it's all put together. Um, for the fork, obviously the whole shaft has been masked where the um, lower bearing race, um, the axle has been all masked off. One trick we, we did here is I didn't actually remove the needle bearings in here. This thing's in perfect shape, still rolls really good you know, on the uh, pivot here. Generally, these needle bearings last quite a long time. Maybe if it's exposed to water and rusted up, may need to rebuild that. I'm not going to go over how to rebuild this. It's actually pretty tricky. You need to pry out these, these things and use a hydraulic press to actually rebuild this little assembly. And we have the whole kit. I don't have the part number offhand, but there's a whole entire kit to rebuild this here. Yeah, there's basically two fork link kits. Robot was talking about the 16 versus 20 millimeter one. This is also different here on the, the 20. So the so. larger spindle one uses a larger pivot pin there. And to, re to replace that, install that. Um, whoops. Sorry. To install that, you do definitely need a hydraulic press, which makes it a very difficult installation. Sorry, Robot. Oh, no problem. Um, one little cheater thing we're going to do, since I cut the O-rings out, you see these two O-rings? I'm actually going to slice them with a a razor blade and make it about the same diameter and you can actually super glue the o-ring ends back together and you can pack a little bit of grease in there and just use your your fingers or two needle noses and hold you know hold the actual o-ring ends together and super glue them and for the most part that will suffice for a dust keep the dust and moisture out of these bearings here so pretty simple little like thing to do if you're just going to get this powder coated or paint it with these uh, bearings all in here. Uh, the only other part that's been powder coated here is this same thing. All inside here has been masked out. You want to clean this really good because sometimes you'll have sand residue all in this um, cavity that where the speedometer drive goes. You know, all here and also the cavity where the, the brake pin goes through and the two shafts for the, the, brake, the brake shoes. Steve was actually sanding them, cleaning them up a little bit. And there's this threaded boss for the uh, cable adjuster. That's actually an M5 by 8 tenths of a millimeter pitch. You could chase that with a tap to clean that out. And we'll go ahead and do that. Well, you got the tap out too. You want to go ahead and actually do the same thing on the actual uh screw that holds the speedometer housing in. Because again, a lot of crust and stuff builds up in there. So you got that five by 0 0.80 tap out, do that spot and then that spot basically. And pretty much that's what you need to do to prep this. 
One final thing on the fork, Robot did mention that this whole thing gets masked off from here down. The threads, this is an opportune time to go over to like a wire wheel and just pass the threads over it and make sure those threads are in good condition. A lot of times rust builds up there and it makes it really tricky to like re-thread the, uh, you know, the ring nuts back in place. It's nice when the threads are perfectly clean, you can almost tighten the fork with your bare hand. It's nice when you go and actually install it back in the frame. And last thing is sometimes you'll see this is really hammered if tr somebody's tried to steal the bike over the years, the actual hardened steel pin from the uh, column lock. And you'll see this kind of flared out. You want to just take a file to this and kind of make it smooth. This one's in really good shape. I'm not going to mess with it, but just I, definitely check it. You don't want to put the whole fork all in the bike and find out that the, the column lock won't actually engage with the slot. And I have seen that, that issue before. I guess one more thing on the fork. <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of see this uh, cast aluminum knuckle. This basically contacts the stops in the frame. And this is basically what keeps the handlebars from over rotating one way or another. It's very common that you'll see a bike that actually has a dent at the top of the leg shield. That's because the stops are either worn out on this cast aluminum knuckle or the stops in the frame are effed up and the handlebars are rotating too far. So this is the opportune time before you send this off the powder coat to TIG weld that back up with material and reshape it. Um, and we'll, at some point in time, we'll show the repair in the frame that you can kind of do as well. So you always want to inspect that if they're too rounded off or if you see that telltale detents at the top of the frame, that's an indication that something's wrong with your steering stops. And this is the time to get all that fixed too. I swear, I think that's the last thing we can say on the fork. Pretty much. Yeah, definitely <laughs> got to clean it. Check that and make sure, you know, got a straight fork one way to tell. <laughs> We're not done. Yeah, with the fork. I'm not done. That's all true right. though, actually. If you had this, say if you had this perfectly level, if you put a level here and it's perfectly level and then you put a level here, these are actually both in the same plane. So a lot of times you'll, visually you'll see a fork. Actually, a scooter will still ride kind of okay with a bent fork, but I wouldn't put a bent fork in my own bike. Basically, I've seen them where this is normally bent back by like a degree or two, you know, and, you know, from hitting whatever, off-roading or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Something I would do. Another I'm sure all my bikes have bent forks. <laughs> Another final thing that actually gets powder coated, this is actual brake actuating cam. Believe it or not, these have actually become a difficult part to source this day and age. So what we'll do is this gets powder coated. Normally these are zinc plated, uh, but again, zinc plating is kind of tricky anymore. So what we'll usually do is if we can kind of paint it or powder coat it instead of zinc plate it, that's what we'll usually do. So this has been powder coated. Again, we masked off very carefully the part that actually passes through the hub. So when we go to reassemble, that thing fits in there smoothly like it should, but the exposed lever is now the same nice silver as the hub. So when this is all put together, it's gonna look awesome. And again, if there's any residual rust or anything like that, you can use some you know, 120 grit or whatever uh, and just kind of clean that up. And a couple other things we're gonna do. Basically, a lot of the hardware, the bearings are all gonna be, get replaced in this uh, fork here. Uh, we sell whole kits that include all the seals and the bearings and the circlips that that are part of, part of the hub. This is actually the pivot for, that goes into your back plate. And these are your bearings for your actual hub right here. But the kit that we actually offer basically is all of this stuff. So essentially it's all of the consumables. So there's the two oils, the three oil seals, the O-ring, and then all the bearings. These bits, like this little special notched uh, D washer is actually difficult to source. It's not included in that kit, so you have to reuse that. And same thing with this little thrust washer that goes on is the first thing that actually goes on the actual spindle. Uh, but yeah, that's basically what you get in that kit. Uh, we haven't actually made that kit in QuickBooks. Let's just call that kit P Fork Kit. So there it is, that's how part numbers get created here. That new part number, <laughs> you just saw it, you witnessed it live and on the air, is basically gonna be all those consumable parts so you can kind of completely overhaul a P-Series fork. And there'll be a 16 millimeter version one and a 20 millimeter version one. And a couple other parts, always a good idea to replace this, uh, the actual nut that tightens down on the fork. This is a special type of nut that actually gets peened down onto the slot. So a lot of times the old nut that comes off has been hammered. Definitely don't want to have the front hub come off. So good idea to replace this nut. Replacing the hardware that actually holds the shock. The small little screw that retains the four parts that go into the speedometer drive. I'm not sure if this part's really available anymore, but I kind of cleaned it up. This is the original zinc plating, just cleaned up in a parts washer, still looks really good. So I reuse that. If it's really rusty, 
Again, you could probably powder coat it, be fine. Uh, new brake shoes, the Omega Clips, you know, 00061, brake spring 058, 228, I think it is. Same for pretty much all the 10 inch bikes. And my favorite part of all the parts that go on this fork, it's this little rebuild kit for the actual cable clamp. Piaggio part includes all the, the cable pinch bolt, the little pin, and the cotter pin that holds the, the clevis pin, I think that is. Uh, 154 We also sell the kit for the rear brake, too. It goes on the engine. Uh, last thing, the hub, or I'm at the, the shock itself. You can see this one. The shock actually works pretty good. Customer wants it to look nice. I'm not going to bother. It's not worth the time cleaning this thing up. Aftermarket shock. They're pretty inexpensive. 332-928 AM. Good quality Italian aftermarket shock patterned after the original one. And it's all built, ready to go. You're not just replacing the dampener. A lot easier just to deal with the whole, whole assembly. Uh, some of these parts up here are hard to get. We do have the rubber bits. There's an external star washer. Usually it's in pretty good shape. Uh, the easiest way to take this apart, take a uh, 17 millimeter socket on the, the impact here. That one's pretty loose, and I had it apart, but sometimes they'll take a little bit. Got the star washer, large fender washer. Part number on those two rubber buffers, uh, which we'll be replacing, we just didn't grab them yet. Part number on those is 174085, I believe, and you'll take two of them. But you can kind of see those are pretty smashed down, ovaled out, dry rotted. Almost every time you do a shock, you actually want to replace that. And this is an opportune time to mention another part number we have in the uh, Scooter West offering. That's basically a complete, uh, shock installation kit that basically kind of includes the consumable hardware and the rubber bits. Uh, that's already on the Scooter West site. I can't remember the part number, but it'll magically be popped up on the screen when you actually watch this video, thanks to our videographer, Scott Jones. But I think that's it as far as the components of the fork. We're gonna cut and then we'll go into like actually putting stuff back together, right, Robot? Yep, and I'll kind of show, I have some of the specialty tools that drive the bearings in. To be honest with you, you home, Doing it from home, you could just use uh, regular sockets. I mean, it might might do a small amount of damage to your sockets, but <laughs> you know, work just as well as the factory tools to put this fork back together. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and build the hub. Uh, one thing that makes it a little easier, obviously heating up the aluminum parts, and that allows the aluminum to expand for the bearings to drop in a little easier. Um, the needle bearing that goes on from the inside, that's what I'm gonna put in first. It actually goes in an additional, about a four millimeters. And this tool actually drives it in right to the, the correct depth for the little seal that goes in after. Uh, one thing with heating up these new parts, you wanna take care not to overheat them. Uh, the powder coating, it can handle quite a bit of temperature, but it will start to yellow if you get it too hot. And I just heat it up for whatever that was, about a minute, and that's, that's plenty, plenty hot enough for what we're doing here. So you can see the little step, that the, about the four millimeter step right there. And we'll wipe a little bit of grease on the, the actual bearing. So slide into the, so it's brand new bearing. Again, make sure it's perfectly square in there. Takes a little bit of effort usually to drive these in. A lot easier with with the extra heat and there it is and you could if you look right in here you could see it's about four millimeters deeper than the actual flush surface right there so that bearings driven in got the little seal again a little grease on the seal pretty much drove that in a little easier with the larger flat surface there so go ahead and flip the hub over And you can see I was doing that on a wood block to kind of protect this edge here. And this is the new cap and that will cover up the small amount of distortion that's on there. OK, 
Okay, where did Steve put that there? All right, got the new bearing here. And we'll go ahead and pack this bearing with a little bit of grease before we put it in there. And you just kind of want to take the grease and roll the, uh, the grease into the, the bearing race. And keep on, you know, keep on pushing the grease into the bearing. Robot said pushing grease into the bearing. I had to make a cameo. Oh, uh, that's always good. How's it going, Robot? Pretty good. Nice. Using the factory tools as drifts. We're building the hub first. And so you want to use something that's just slightly smaller diameter than the bearing. So pretty much find a big socket. Oh yeah, puppy. And kind of when you hear that, that kind of solid tap noise, that, that kind of indicates when the bearing's actually seated all the way down. New, new circlip was used here, so use your circlip pliers of appropriate size. And just drop that in, make sure it drops into the clip there. So that bearing's all greased up. Needle bearing. I'm sure Steve will have some comment for this one. Oh, yeah, dude. using your pinky, the look at the, look pinky at the length pack of that bearing there. Look at the length of robot's fingers. That's how you know he's a good technician. Good mechanics <laughs> have long fingers. It's true. All right, so there you go. There's a hub. It's true. New seals all pat, tapped in there and bearings all ready to go. So we're going to put that off to the side. A little hot. Nice and toasty. A little hot potato. That was a little hot. I got thick calluses on my short, stubby sausage fingers. So completely unfazed by that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and mount the, the fork in, in the pipe, pipe section of the vise. All right, installed one of the, the sealing O-rings right here. And basically, this O-ring's a little larger than the original O-ring. When you rebuild this, this whole knuckle, usually you roll the O-rings down these sides and build this whole thing, then roll them up into the groove. But again, we don't have that luxury since it's all, all together already. So basically, I'm going to cut a little section out of this O-ring, make a little slot, just cut with a sharp razor blade. Razor you piece you cut out. And kind of size it. See, eh, it's going to have to be somewhere about there. I kind of made a little mark on it. And you can even see the other piece I already cut out. Basically, just make sure you cut, cut the O-ring square so we'll super glue back together as silly as that sound i probably need to cut a little bit more but i'll check it again here and well how thick is this o-ring robot is this like an eighth inch or something like that? that's pretty healthy yeah yeah this one's a good you know about two and a half millimeters so it's gonna be a little tight so pretty much just gotta use something to kind of hold together while the the super glue cures here and if people are kind of giving us flack for uh super gluing o-rings together uh, we learned this uh this is a nasa trick so if it's good enough for a space shuttle it's probably good enough for your 1980s scooter but the other thing too is actually virtually no moisture actually can get into this section of the bike anyways the way the pressure fit is with that centering pin so really all this does is just keep like excess grime and stuff out so i'm just going to hold it there kind of put a little super glue on it hey should we see who's here yeah check it out Let's see who's here Maybe it's dinner. So there you go. Both O-rings are in there. Hey, come on in, Christina. We're shooting a video. Coffee. This is a lunch wagon. That's good for TV. It's like a reality show now. Oh, that cool breeze feels pretty nice. <laughs> This is uh, winter time in San Diego. It's kind of warm out. It's like 90 degrees. It's hot. All right, so that's it. That's uh, basically prepping the uh, pivot pin on the lower fork assembly. Oh, God, those, those O-rings look good. That's going to be the highlight of the bike, a showpiece right there. It's all together. You're going to be like, man, how'd you get those O-rings so awesome? So we're going to go on now to prepping the backing plate and getting that ready to install. Warming up this part so the bearings will go in a little easier. 
Get a little more smoke on this one. Burning the wood that I have it on. Leftover grease in there. And that's that's all the heat I want to put into that. So we're we're good to go. While robot's prepping that, you can see I'm kind of packing the uh, two little needle cage needle bearings with grease, getting those ready for him. So that's ready to go. Obviously, everything's kind of hot, so kind of you know keep your fingers out of there. I'm dropping it into the center well, and you want to drive these right to their their flush. Right there. Oh. So I had that one centered. You can't really see it with the camera view, but. Again, using like a punch right here. Perfect. The other side, there's actually a step where the, the oil seal goes in. And again, I'm setting it down on the flat surface there. It's good to go. I'm gonna use a little smaller drift right here. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and use the socket. This is what you're going to be using at home. You're probably not going to have the factory drift, so you're just going to be using a selection of your uh, standard socket sets. So there you go. Kind of started, actually. And here's my socket right here. You obviously want to make sure it's perfectly centered, because the sockets have a tendency you want to slip off. And I'm just doing it flush with that, that first ridge in there. It needs a couple more taps. It's not the end of the world if you go a little too far with it. So there you go. That one's driven in. Steve's handing me a seal. He already put a little grease on it. Doesn't take much grease. Watch out, everything's still a little warm, but a lot of times you could just press the seal right in. And I forgot to mention, but the seal has two directions and I have the actual like kind of flush side is pointing out. The actual side where you see the little spring in there and the lip is actually uh, on the inside in there. Yeah, that's one thing I remember learning early on in doing this. When it comes to any oil seals in general, the spring side is always in to what it's, towards what it's sealing. So that's why that's that way. I'll get the fork out of the way. No, can, we'll go ahead put it on. and go to putting it on. So pretty, a couple things you gotta set up. Here's that thrust washer. It's like a little hardened steel washer. Put a little grease on it. Just drop it, oops. On the floor? On the floor, just like I did there. So, got a couple hairs on it, sorry. All right, there we go, actually. I'll go ahead and grease up the uh, actual spindle a little bit. You put a little more grease in here if you like. That's my job as the, te as the assistant on this one. That is warm in there. You got this O-ring right here? It's like a 285. Um, it's included in the overhaul kit. Mm -hmm. That's all that you need to know. So there you go, this O-ring. You see that where it's kind of like, I have it off to the edge right there? That's, you want to just hold it off to the edge. That's the trick for installing mm -hmm. those O-rings. This will be interesting. A lot of times when stuff gets powder coated, it almost adds too much thickness to the bottom of that spindle and it makes it so the thing doesn't fit all the way back on. So we'll kind of see how this goes. This is the first take. Yeah, the uh, D-shaped washer. You know, and if, if I'm having trouble with the, uh, getting the clip in, I have a brand new uh, sir clip. We're gonna actually have to go backwards and, and file some of the parts. But that was that special like uh, spacer washer that has that D notch in it. That D portion of the flat spot, the D portion of the notch, correspond to a specific spot on that spindle. And didn't get it the first time, so I'll just go ahead and lift the hub. It's the Yeah, the D-shaped washer needs a little, little more work to get it onto the flat here. I don't have needle nose on me. Normally I'd have needle nose on me that just dump the D-shaped washer back out. We see that thrust washer kind of sticking to this part right here. And FYI, the little, the little flat is actually right here. It faces kind of in. Another thing is the shock, the shock part of the knuckle I have kind of facing towards, you know, obviously it rotates on there, but. All right, let's try this again. All right. Here, let let's... me hold the O-ring down. Okay. So Steve's holding the O-ring. There's a clip. 
So yeah, like he was saying, that this thing does spin, but you know, obviously the shock mount is this upper portion here, so you want to have that facing the lower shock mount. You need to have facing towards the upper one, or you're gonna have problems. This so, is the moment of truth. We'll see if the snap ring will actually seat and click into place. Looks like it just did it. Yeah, it's in on one side. You obviously with a snap ring, you want to make sure it's all the way around. And it looks like we're okay here, actually. Cool. So the powder coating in this case didn't add in too much thickness, so we were able to get everything back together. Once Robot gives the uh, rubber stamp of approval, it's good? Yeah, all, right. all good. So it rotates freely. If there's too much powder coating there, you need to actually, actually file some of that powder coating off. And At this point, I can release that O-ring. That O-ring just goes back to its natural spot and kind of keeps that joint you know, clean from debris and everything. Yeah, it just ro rolls right in, kind of wipe off our extra grease. Let's show this on the camera here. It's still a little warm. You can kind of see in there the snap ring, spindle coming through. Get a good shot of that already. Good enough. Then on the back side, you can kind of see, you know, that's where that O-ring goes. And then the shock mount is this one here. So basically once this thing is all ready to go, once the shock's in there, it'll look more or less kind of like that. Got one more big oil seal to install. Robot's got it in his hand, but there's a little step down in this backing plate for this large uh, outside diameter, large inside diameter oil seal. And I'm, I'm actually putting it on after the fact because it gives you a little more room to drop the D-shape and work, and work the C-clip, so that's why I'm actually installing that after the fact. And this, this, this little seal, a lot of times you just make sure it's pretty square. You can just give it little taps, you know. Right now it's kind of not. Normally you could kind of take this out of the vise and set this knuckle on a firm surface. Right now I'm just holding it up, but it's pretty simple. And I have the one size down a little bit. It's not the end of the world with a seal, but you could take um, a punch of some sort. The seal's pretty, doesn't take much pressure to actually install. Oh, but just yeah, giving it a couple little taps so it's flush all the way around. And again, there's a recess, so this seal will basically bottom out. So you can't really push this one in too far. Give it one more. And there we go. That's plenty good enough. I wiped some of the grease off the outside there. I always like to, we're basically ready to put the brakes on now. I always like to grease up these pivot pins a little bit. I tell you, every time you take a hub off that's been on for a long time, the brake shoes are all practically rusted to these pins. Um, so it's kind of nice starting fresh, fresh grease in there, fresh grease in where the cam goes. And when you're taking these apart, say you have, um, I didn't, you know, there's no video of us taking it apart, but a lot of times I have take apart an old hub that has just completely rusted out brake shoes. These will be on here, you know, all tight with the spring, and they'll barely move on these pivots right here. A lot of times I'll take a punch, I mean, this isn't the punch I'd use, save the spring, instead of prying your spring and messing the spring all up, you're throwing away the brake shoes. You can actually just hit, hit this little aluminum tab when you're removing them and break that tab off, quickly get your brake shoes off. And if they're, if they're really seized up on these, um, the, the steel pins, you just heat this up with the torch I was using to heat up and basically you just work the uh, brake pads back and forth and eventually they'll walk right off the uh, shafts. And I have to do that a lot, a lot of bikes that are just like rust buckets that, again, you know, brake shoes are cheap parts. You never really want to reuse them if they're all rusty and nasty anyways. So. I'm taking the uh, brake adjuster and threading that in place. This doesn't necessarily have to be done now, it just needs, needs to be done at some point in time. You ready to install those, Robot? Yeah, that's ready to get installed. On a lot of the American P200s, they actually have a little external spring. It's only for the American market. I'm not sure why they put it. You don't really need it. Uh, this bike, somebody lost it years and years ago, so not putting it back on. Most of the time, they're all rusty anyways. Don't really need it. The, uh, the actual brake spring will suffice. Uh, so Steve's kind of holding that thing in place. I already uh, strung the, the new spring through. And one final thing on this cam, 
you got to make sure you have the cam face in the right direction. You can't see it from the underside, but the actual brake connection point is over here. So you want to make sure you kind of have that oriented 180 in the correct direction. So basically, I'll just... This is a good trick. We've done this a bunch of times yeah. with these brakes on. So I, I, I align one side, and sometimes with these new brake pads, you can actually see that this one's not going to um, want to seat in. See how there's like a gap here? It doesn't want to seat in. And unfortunately, sometimes you just got to take these off. I got to go to the bench grinder and actually grind both sides. So I'll go ahead and do that real quick and make sure. I mean, Steve's going to pop that up. You see how it doesn't fit actually in the groove? Actually, let's see. Let's show him that actually. Well, actually, let's take this out. It's going to fit there, but when it's in, in this thing, it's yeah. not going to fit. So, you know, that the actual slot is actually recessed a little bit. And it's probably a combination of the extra powder coating on this material, on that. These brake shoes maybe being a little thicker here. No big deal. You just pretty much go to a bench grinder, or if you don't have a bench grinder, you can take a file and file both sides. And I, I would say 50% of the time I have to do that whenever I put brake shoes on a, a vintage Vespa. Right. Got to do some, some sort of like little modification, filing, fit. Here, I'll go, I'll go do that. Okay. All right, but we'll cut, and then we'll come back once these are ground down, ready to install. Okay, so this is take two. We went ahead and ground down the brake shoes a tiny bit, and we also took some of the excess powder coating off that other surface there. So we should be good. And normally, if you have the shock installed, this thing doesn't move around, which makes it easier. But since Robot and I are tag teaming this thing, I'm just going to kind of hold it for him. So again, get that first one down, get it in the slot, and check this out. See how I'm, I'm kind of actually levering it over that cam? And I, I'm using that kind of as a pivot. I'm not, actually not in the slot. If you drop it in the slot, you're not going to ever be able to get it on the um, pin right here. But see how I'm just rotating it? Now it's on the pin. And that's, you know, pretty close. You know, sometimes you can lift it up a little bit here. It just needs a couple little taps. But if you don't you want to drop it all the way down. And, you know, it wants to go down perfectly. Uh, you yes. got to push both sides down equally, otherwise yeah. it'll kind of get cockeyed and won't see it fully. But that's pretty much it. Then you take and wipe the excess grease off. Make sure it works. Kind of give it a test. See how both, both sides are opening equally. Got the Omega clips right here. Nicest thing to install these are a good pair of uh, needle nose. Again, we've seen people struggle with this, but this right here is the trick. Kind of keeping some pressure on the... Uh, the sir clip or the omega clip just to kind of guide it in and then use the pressure of the needle nose to, to pull it right on. So nice and simple. And that's okay, they kind of rotate around, they won't come off. And there you go. Right. Go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and assemble the shock here. Drop the rubber spacer on. Take your existing top plate, it goes on this direction. You can see the direction it's stamped. And it can, you can put it wherever, because it's easy to adjust even after you install it. Drop the upper rubber part, the large flat washer, external star washer, little drop of Loctite on the threads. You could torque this bolt, 25 foot-pounds, but it's nearly impossible to torque because the actual shock shaft will just spin. So the easiest way to go about it is use like a, like a smaller size impact wrench. Yeah, so that's a 3 h drive. It's a good quality one. But uh, all we're going to do is just blast this thing down there. That's well over 25 foot-pounds right there. And that thing... And, and then the cool thing is you can still pivot that, so... So, you know, if I need to change the position of it, you still change the position. Uh, this is pretty much ready to install. I got new hardware on. Ready to go. Let's put that thing in there. So pretty much, you can see it drops on the slot. Sometimes these are a little tight. Uh, you may need to file some of your powder coating or paint or whatever. Oh, we're looking good. And pretty much, I already have it all, everything lined up. So these bolts go down from the top. The, the fork the has slot. actually got notches in it. So, you know, the, the fork itself holds the head of the bolt tight. Use a lock washer. Lock washers. Zero, was it 16408? Again. People always ask which direction these need to go. Uh, my opinion has always been it probably doesn't really matter, but what do you say, robot? Uh, the way I always go, it's actually the opposite way they're installed normally from the factory, but just to make it a little easier. 
Got it. You go this so way because then the you get a wrench. Easier. You know, get to the nut a little bit easier. But technically it doesn't matter, right? Technically it doesn't matter, they'll work either way. But from the factory, actually they're the other direction. But this way is a little easier for tightening down the nut. So um, good. I got my wrench ready to go. 13 millimeter wrench. And this one's a little, little tight in here. You could use like a wobble or something if you wanted to, or just a, a closed end wrench. And if you want to get technical, you could torque it to 16 foot pounds. But just snug them, fine for a, a grade eight M8 bolt here. So there and there. New lock washers are used. Other one, you're gonna need to use a wrench to hold the, um, the bolt here. See how that's loose? You're gonna have to tighten it. It's actually gonna distort the, uh, the plate on the shock a little bit. There's that one. All right, and then Steve's gonna show how to uh, put the cable clamp all together here. There we go. So we got that cable clamp. Again, this part number is 154738. This is Robot's favorite. But essentially, this is what you get in this kit. You get both the plates, the pin, uh, the cotter pin, and then the special uh, bolt with the hole through it, and then the nut. Um, and you'll notice these plates are stamped, so they really only go on one correct way. I always get a little confused and have to always relook at it. Uh, but I think I got it set up right. This uh, inner plate, I call this the inboard plate, the one with the little notch in it, because that goes in towards the middle of the hub. That little thing is designed so you can take the excess of the cable and tuck it back underneath there. Uh, well, yeah, we're looking good. That's right, right? Look at our little parts tray. God, Vespa thinks of everything. So there's a little hole there. I like to put the, the little clevis pin on the inside. It just looks a little cleaner. Um, I won't bend it over until we're 100% sure we got it right. And the other key thing is this bolt has to pass through from this way, so you can actually tighten the nut on the actual, uh, on the actual bolt. Because keep in mind, let me take this back out again. You zoomed in pretty good, Scotty? You see that hole there? The cable actually passes through that, and then when you tighten this nut, these plates pinch together, and that's what holds the front cable in place. The beauty and simplicity. Who needs hydraulics when you've got cables? But yeah, we'll just kind of leave that nut a little loose right now. Um, and we did put this together the right way, didn't we? I think so. Yeah, it's kind of, it'll kind of work a number yeah. of ways, but the key thing is you want to make sure that once the, the pin is in place and these plate, you want to basically make sure those plates lay flat. If you have one the wrong way, there'll be a gap there, and it's pretty obvious when you're doing it wrong. Basically, a cable, there's a the small hole that's drilled into that bolt. Cable passes through, and then it loops back around and into this little thing. And a lot of times, I'll trim it nice and actually tin the end of the cable with solder so it doesn't fray, make it look, look really nice. We'll have some great videos when it comes to the actual like, cable installation. And, and uh, you know, you saw I bent this cotter pin over with just my fingers, it's so small, but kind of bent it over really clean with a pair of, well, in this case, really crappy needle nose. All right, we're gonna go ahead and put the speedometer drive all together. Uh, you got the four different parts, basically. Uh, I guess six if you count the screw and the washer. You got the actual speedometer gear. Hold them out like that so you can see them. Okay. I'm gonna reposition the fork while Robot's talking about the components. So you got the speedometer gear, it actually goes one direction. It looks identical when you kind of look at it, but you can see this, this has kind of a ramp, a larger hole, and that's to allow the cable to kind of slide in. This other side is a, the smaller square. So the smaller square actually go, drops in to the, um, the well in there. Probably uh, not gonna be able to see that, huh, Scott? And obviously if this gear was kind of stripped out or has any flat spots on it, you want to replace it. Those gears commonly get pretty hammered. 
But again, the versatility of like a bench vise, a freestanding one, this is pretty nice. You know, we'll use this quite a bit for rebuilding motors and stuff too, believe it or so not. So there you go. The smaller square hole drops, drops right down into the well. You can kind of see it's right down there. Kind of making a little greasy mess. Gears dropped in there. Next is this metal slug. You can see it's got the little lip on it, lips on the outside, kind of got a little grease on it. Not going to hurt anything. Kind of drop it down there and it needs to go further than that. Sometimes they'll hang up a little bit. You may need to uh, use something to give it a couple little taps to, to get it down in there. And there you go. So it's in there. Next is the rubber. This actually gets squished by that plate and that's what actually tightens down the cable. Don't need to put any grease on that. That's a pretty cool little thing. If you ever have an instance where your cable's coming out, especially because that rubber is really worn. Vespa kind of figured out by the time they came to that. So essentially that plate squishes down that rubber thing and it keeps the cable, the Speedo cable seated in the hub so the cable won't pull out. And now I got that, the plate, smaller hole, you drop the screw into it. This is where those long fingers come in handy right now. There you go. So Look kind of get it started. And bingo, it's started. Now you could get trick and have some a little wrench in there, but that's that's all I want to do right now. You don't want to actually tighten this down until you get the cable in it. But that's all there is to it to put the speedometer drive down. If nothing doesn't, if something doesn't seed in there, it may still have some grime or really old grease. You definitely need to clean the well that all those parts drop out really well. Make sure it's clean in there. So there you go. Now we're going to put the hub all together, and we'll show you too. Actually, while the robot's grabbing the hub, you see the front brake cable adjuster. Um, and then you actually see these two holes in the fork. The speedometer cable passes through the upper one, and then the front brake passes through the lower one. So the front brake, if you can imagine the housing, comes down and goes straight into that adjuster. The speedo couple comes out, arches, and goes directly into that boss there. All right. Putting a little bit of uh, grease on the actual the speedometer drive gear. And again, this part, you want to make sure it doesn't get sandblasted or any type of paint on it. Because if this is damaged, it will actually just immediately strip out that little plastic gear. Yeah, well, Scott's got the cord free, like Robot was saying, that gear is generally pretty resilient. You know, that's, you know, hardened steel or whatever it may be. This is the actual plastic gear that you can kind of see. And you kind of see, you know, that's kind of a pinion style gear um, that actually contacts that ring gear of the hub. And that's it, what drives the speedometer. Yeah, and it, it may be a little tight right now. No, there it is. It's turning. See how I'm just checking to make sure it turns? It turns good. It's gonna have a little resistance, but you know, that's turning just fine. So a that's little a, grease on there. Uh, you don't have too much grease, right? Yeah, not too much. Cause if you put too much grease, it's gonna actually uh, roll past the seal and fling onto your brake pads. But where you could put a dab of grease, you could take a big old finger goo of it and just roll that right in there and get that right. You know, that, that's kind of like extra residual grease to keep that speedometer drive gear lubricated. And you don't need to like really pack it in there. This gear will kind of spread it around. That's the grease that we sell on the Scooter West site. This stuff is the best grease we've ever found for working on these old Vespas. You can use it on just about everything. Nice and stringy, really sticky. Uh, God, this stuff's great. So there you go. So ready, ready to drop the hub on. Don't want to hammer this hub on. You actually kind of want to work it, you know, you know, with the, the gear, kind of make sure, see how it's just working. Sometimes if you got brake shoes that drag a little bit too, you may need to pop this hub back off and clip, you know, sand the brake shoes a little bit, sand the inner drub. You know, if it just binds just ever so slightly here, this one is just doing a little bit. First couple times you hit the brakes, it's actually gonna clean up that mess that's, you know, whatever, whatever little bit that's dragging. But this thing's turning really nice actually, so it's good to go. Here's the, the nut right here. You know, Steve's gonna impact it. Technically, you can torque it to, uh, I think it's about 30 foot-pounds is what you torque that to if you wanted to get technical. It's not too critical. It's more important that you use a brand new nut and don't, you know, don't over-tighten it. Part number on that nut is a 126409, 126409. And that nut is specific to the 16 millimeter front axle. Everything's still turning free, so. It's a good sign. The 20 millimeter ones use uh, 
a conventional nut with a cap and a cotter pin and stuff like that. So this is something, a little design that they really only did from like say 77 to 1983 before they upgraded to the 20 mil spindle. And again, yeah, don't mess around, always replace it because you know, you're gonna reinstall the, the old nut and it's already been distorted right here, right where the actual locking, you know, locks can go. Uh, this is a punch I've kind of like ground on the bench grinder to make. Basically, it just, it's kind of got like a, a flat rectangle and it will give, give that punch, you know, punch a slot. Basically, there's a slot that's in the axle and that's where I'm gonna punch this. So, kind of line up. And see that? That's all you need. And it distorted the nut and dropped it into that little slot right there. You see, that's the brand new nut distorted just perfectly. You want to distort just about that much where it drops right into that machine groove. And there's no way that's coming out unless you, you know, hit it with an impact to pull it off. So. Some people are probably going to comment at this point, well, it's like, man, that where's the seal that kind of seals in that ball bearing? Um, you know, it's sometimes you actually have well, the, like the, the seal that has the oil lip on it. Uh, those that work well. Originally, they had like a weird steel case outer that protected those ball bearings. Really, if you pack it with fresh grease and put the cap on, uh, this thing is totally sealed. So it's kind of hogwash. Someone that kind of whines about not having anything more than that in there. I don't know if Robot's got the actual cap. Mm -hmm. Thought I saw it somewhere. And one there thing about is. this cap, if you're going for some, sh you know, show, show chrome kind of finish, this cap is actually made of stainless steel and it's kind of got a little bit of a rough finish, the new caps. You can actually hit that with like 400 grit sandpaper in all directions and buff it out to where it's like a mirror finish where it looks like a little moon cap. Uh, but basically, we're, we're not going to go do that. <laughs> not going to do that on this one. Just going to kind of drive it in there and it, don't want to hit it with a hammer if it's going to be too tight. You know, hit it with wood or a, a rubber mallet. That one's going in a, not so square, so I'll probably try again. I'm gonna I'll probably even give it the tap with the wood. It would probably be more than adequate. And again, it's probably, there's a little powder coating on the lip. It's a brand new uh, cap with a little bit of a sharp edge here. You know, if you're really struggling with it, you may, you may just wanna hit that with a bench grinder, sandpaper or whatever, so. Let me try using my hand as a hammer. Not working so good. Let's see if maybe with this handy block I'll get it. Well, that's pretty much it, really. Yeah. At this point, the fork is ready to get set off to the side until we actually go to install it in the frame. 